come home. If you've not done it thus far, would you go to the internet and grab the sheet of paper entitled Come Home? As we plunge deep into Luke chapter 15, we're going to be looking at the heart of God. And our hero is not the prodigal son. Our hero is the loving father. So I would urge you to download this and then take a few moments to either put it on your device, but start that process of taking some notes. Now come with me to Luke chapter 15, verse 11. We'll start in just a moment, but it could be that you've got a burden on your heart. And maybe you see the number up here on your television screen and pop that into your phone. Uh, maybe there's a special prayer need. Maybe there's something that you're dealing with. Uh, maybe you're like Reginald and Valencia from last week. Reginald and Valencia called in and they gave their lives to Jesus Christ. They did a 180. They stepped out of darkness and into light. They stepped out of death and into life as they chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. God is calling you, and He's calling you to come home. Softly and tenderly, He's calling you to come home. Well, if you're ready, let me begin, and uh, I want you to be sure to know this. God has wired His world with home in mind. Do you remember the Wizard of Oz? Uh, there's Dorothy. And Dorothy's most famous line from the Wizard of Oz is, there's no place like home. Well, we all know that to be true. Surveys have revealed that the most evocative word in the human language is the word for home. It's like a magnet. It paints a picture of solitude and also solidarity with our family. So, I want you to understand that God has wired you for home. Let me say that it's also the wiring of nature. Think about it. I love to study the animal kingdom. Uh, and let me just run through a few things with you. Did you know there's an animal, a bird, called a homing pigeon? And the homing pigeon has been used for over 3,000 years to deliver messages because there's something about that pigeon that can make its way home. You can take it a thousand miles away, and it will go back to the same place that it came from. And did you know it can fly at up to a hundred miles an hour to deliver the message and to get back home? There's also the swallows, the swallows of Capistrano. We were on a California trip, and I took my family to see the Mission San Juan of Capistrano because it is an amazing wonder of nature that these little swallows will fly all the way from Argentina in South America to California. Who leads them? How do they get there? They have a tiny little brain, and yet they come in with pinpoint accuracy because God has wired them with a homing device. It's interesting, the wildebeest. I've been to the Serengeti over in Tanzania. Two million wildebeest will move north from the Serengeti to Masamara in Kenya, and scientists have no comprehension how they know the way back home, and yet they do it year after year. Starting in July, they'll take a three-month trek that lands them in Kenya at the precise feeding ground where they were nine months earlier. It's astonishing, the wonders of nature, the butterfly. Now, this, this is the one that takes the cake. The monarch butterfly travels all the way from Canada by the millions to a location just outside of Mexico City because there's a special tree that draws them in. It's amazing. They have a brain the size of the head of a pin, and yet they are wired with a homing device. Or what about this one, the salmon? Oh, I love Alaska. I've gotten to go there nine times, and I've caught a bunch of salmon. That's probably, this picture represents one of the greatest fishing trips of all times. I was at a nameless lake. We'd flown over glaciers, and there were literally thousands of salmon coming up this quarter of a mile ribbon of water into this gorgeous lake. There were eagles, there were bears. I stood in one place and caught 26 silver salmon, but that salmon, if it had been tagged, seven years earlier, was born or spawned in that lake. So it goes and wanders the Pacific and then comes home? It's astonishing. Now here, here's the point. Would you make this note? God equipped you with a homing device. If God equips 
animals in nature and a butterfly with the brain the size of a pinhead, I want you to understand God has hardwired your DNA with this sense of what home looks like. It's a supernatural wiring. The Scripture talks about it in Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has wired eternity into your heart. You have this deep sense that you have been created. You're not a cosmic accident on a meaningless journey to nowhere. No, my friend, God made you, and you inherently know that. There's this sense of, I am a creature that God made, and He's made me for Himself. The Scripture tells us that God, in this particular passage, is your Creator Father, and you are drawn back toward Him. So, let's plunge deep into this parable about the loving Father and understand that God has wired you for Himself. And even now, even now, my friend, He's calling you home. Now, maybe you have wandered far, and you need to come home. Or maybe you're the prodigal that stayed at home and you wondered in your heart. But I want you to get before the Lord right now as we come to this scripture and be prepared to come home. Jesus, he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, and he went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. He went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Jews do not eat pork. So this is a terrible twist in the story. Look at verse 16. And as he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, no one was giving anything to him. Look at verse 17. And when he came to his senses. Yellow highlight it, double underline it. This is the key. When he came to his God-given senses, when the homing device was reactivated, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He felt compassion for him. He ran and embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf. Kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and he has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Well, let's pray. Father, would you cover these moments with your spirit? Get me out of the way so that people will have an encounter with you, their living, loving, heavenly Father who calls us home. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Well, here's what I want to do. Let's follow God's roadmap to return home. Let's begin here. Let's begin with rebellion. When we meet this this young man, this prodigal son he is deemed, we see a, a young man who is overrunning with rebellion. He's got a rotten attitude. He has a foul heart. And he essentially is saying to his dad, I'm sick and tired of living under your rules and your roof. I want to get out of here. I want to go have some fun. Do you know what the essence of sin is, my friend? Sin is basically saying, God, I don't need you. I'm going to do life on my own. I'm going to make up my own rules. This is what Adam and Eve encountered in the Garden of Eden. That's how ancient this sin pull is. What did Satan say to Eve? He said, uh, Eve, darling, hey, you're looking good. (laughs) Hey, Eve, darling, I hear that there's 
a wonderful, delicious, succulent fruit, the best fruit in all of the land, and you are forbidden to eat it. Satan just pulls her in. She said, but we have access to everything. But God has warned us to stay away from that special fruit. And what does Satan do? He toys with her. He tantalizes her. And he tempts her. And he's basically saying, God is cheating you out of the best. You see, Satan continues to play that same old game. I want you to understand how, how Satan works, friends. It's, uh, it's a little bit like fishing. <laughs> I love to fish. That's how Satan works. As a matter of fact, uh, Satan works with um, hooks and lures. Uh, this, is a, this is a June bug lizard. And it's all beat up because the biggest bass I've ever caught, I caught with this June bug lizard one spring morning two years ago. I, I put that hook, the hook, I put the hook in, and then I threaded the hook through the body of this lizard. And when you get that hook hidden and you throw it out there to Mr. Bass, Mr. Bass thinks he's going to eat breakfast. But instead, when you set that hook, the bass becomes your supper. That's how it works. That's what Satan does to you. You see, he individualizes temptation. He knows what will lure you in. My friend, I want you to be wise and be aware that Satan, oh, he is calling you. You may say, but Pastor Jay, why why is it wired that way? Why is the world set up so that I can turn my back on the God who loves me? Because God has given you a free will, my friend. And you've got to take personal responsibility for the choices that you make. The scripture makes it abundantly clear in Galatians chapter 6. It's called the principle of sowing and reaping. Let me remind you of it. This is what the young prodigal didn't understand. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit, he will reap eternal life. Oh, my friend, here's what I want you to understand. That young prodigal, he had a rotten, rebellious attitude, and that led to terrible activities and actions. He stepped right in to Satan's tempting trap. Let's go to step number two. Step number two, uh, this is the map feature. It's called move to realization, move to realization. All right, so here's what the young man does. He comes to his father, and he says, Dad, I'm sick and tired of living under your rules and your roof. I want to get out of here. I want to go have some fun. I'm stifled under your standards. So the father, he could have said, son, you're out of here. But instead, uniquely, he complies with the request. In that day, a Jewish father, if he had two sons, the oldest got two-thirds and the younger son got a third. So evidently, he liquidated some assets, gave the young man this bag of money. Do you think you went out and spent it wisely? Oh, no. This young prodigal, he took a trip straight over Fool's Hill. He went to the far country, the Scripture says. He insulted his father by saying, Dad, if you're not going to die, give me my money, and I'm out of here. And off he went. Don't you know that as he was leaving, his father was yelling behind him, Son, I love you. Son, always remember that we'll leave the light on for you. Son, you'll never wander too far away that you can't come back home. But his ears were so stuffed with rebellion, I doubt if he heard a word. Well, there he got into the far country, and oh, at first, he was in the penthouse. He was living high, wide, and handsome until he ran out of dough, and then he ran out of friends. They cleared out. And soon this young man that was sick of home became homesick because a famine hit the land. And the Scripture says that he was so hungry that he went to work for a hog farmer. Now, when Jesus' hearers heard that the young man went to work at a hog farm, I'm sure that there was almost an audible sound of revulsion. Jews don't do pork. They're kosher. So here's this young man. He is at the bottom of the social heap. 
There's a famine in the land. He is working at a pig farm, and he is living essentially in a pigsty. So just for a moment, let's climb down into the mud with him. I wonder how his life looked. <laughs> it's quite a picture of dirt and degradation. But that's how he looked, friends. You see, it's sold out. He was filthy on the inside, and it was manifest on the outside. As he is feeding the pigs, the Scripture says something remarkable. It says in verse 17, he came to his senses. G. Campbell Morgan, a great preacher of the past, said that this is God's greatest compliment to humanity, that we have the capacity to come to our senses and essentially to turn around. Maybe it was like this. Maybe he was feeding the swine. Perhaps he was watering them. And he looked down into the water trough, and in the watery mirror, he saw his reflection. He probably hadn't seen his reflection in a long time. This handsome Hebrew honk had devolved into a filthy punk. Maybe he looked down into the reflection and he thought for a moment, he was stunned, saying, my God, who is, who's that? And he realizes it's him. It's him. And the Scripture says, and he came to his senses. He realized that he had made an enormous mistake. It certainly reminds us uh, about what happened to David. David, this man after God's own heart, Oh, he succumbed to temptation. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then he committed murder. Then he tried to cover it up. But he had a friend who loved him enough, this man named Nathan, who would tell him the truth. He spoke the truth to David in love. He became God's mirror to David. And David had a realization that he was only fooling himself. That's why the Scripture says in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, friend, you don't just sin against other people. When you defy God's rules and you sow bad seed, you sin against the Lord who loves you and made you. And he goes on to say, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. You see, Nathan gave the good news in the middle of the bad. Well, friends, here's the beautiful moment where his rebellion dissolves into repentance. Let's go to number three, engage in repentance. Engage in repentance. The Scripture says in verse 18 that he said, I will get up and I will go to my father's house. And he makes up this speech and he's going to declare, I've sinned against heaven, Father. I've sinned against you. I've brought shame to the family name. Can you ever forgive me? Just make me one of your hired servants. He pens a note of repentance. And the Scripture says repentance is the key ingredient to being right with your heavenly Father. You see, I see the prodigal owning his mistakes. He stops playing the blame game. Maybe he hated the older brother. Maybe he said, I'm turned out bad because I lost my mother. I mean, people can come up with one excuse after the other. It's easy, friends, to play the blame game and fail to assume the personal responsibility for your choices. Here's the most fundamental truth I know. God wired this into the universe. Choices have consequences. And he finally came to the realization that he'd made bad choices. He had brought shame to his family name. He had dishonored his father and himself. And now after that realization, he starts the process of repentance. And it begins with you owning your problem. Stop blaming your parents. Stop blaming your past. Stop blaming somebody else in your world. Own your problem. That's where it starts. And then begin the process of repenting. The word repent is the word metanoia. It's one of the great biblical words. Meta means change. Noia, your mind. Change your mind. That's what repentance is. Stop running from God and start running to God. Uh, let me give you a great illustration. Let's imagine that you are going to go to Mobile from Montgomery. So you get on the interstate at the juncture of 85, and uh, you're heading to Mobile, you think, but then you pass Prattville. And then you realize, we're heading north, we're not heading south. 
So what do you have to do? You've got to do a road repentance. <laughs> You're on the wrong track. So you've got to get off, admit your mistake, confess it, turn around, and head back south. You see, that's what repentance means. It's turning around. You've got to admit you're going the wrong direction. The Scripture talks about the importance of repentance, uh, and it's a call to a realization that you're on the wrong track. Let me tell you an amazing story. There was a, a man who was a Belgian prince who lived in 1450 named Renold III. Renold III. Now, Renold III was a very interesting guy. He was an enormously large fella. And Renaud III, as a matter of fact, weighed over 500 pounds. Well, Renaud III, um, his brother Edward and Renaud had a giant fight. And Renaud and his brother, after the fallout, they ended up um, having a war. And Renaud was captured, but he was put in a unique prison. He was put in a prison that had no bars, it had a door, but no lock. But the door was the size that a regular man could pass through, but Renault was so large he couldn't get out. As a matter of fact, his brother said, as soon as you get small enough, you can get out of your prison. But every night, they brought him sumptuous food. And Renaud would eat. He could not resist the temptation. And he would eat and he would eat. And people would say, why are you doing that to your brother? And here's what Edward said. He can leave when he so wills. You see, it's an act of your will. That's what repentance is. It's not an act of how you feel. It's an action of your will. One of the great moments is in verse 18 when he says, I will. With resolve. He says, I will get up and go to my Father. My friend, is there something that's keeping you away from the Father? I invite you now to summon the resolve that leads to repentance that will lead to change. You see, the next thing that I want you to do is act. Oh, this is where it all comes into fruition. Perform the right act. That's what we see in verse 20. What happens? This young man, he gets up, he leads, he leaves the pig pen. And he heads to the father's house. Oh, he left like he was a peacock. Now he's coming back a broken pauper. He is covered with mud. He's filthy. He's made all kind of mistakes, but he does the right thing. He heads home. And what does he encounter? Don't you know that he is as nervous as can be? But here's what he encounters. He encounters a father who loves him. Now, a long time ago, there was discovered by biblical scholars who studied the rabbinical tradition, there was discovered a very similar story about a young Jewish man who left his father, he took the money, he dishonored the family, and he came broken back to the dad. Now, remember who's listening to this story. These are the scribes and the Pharisees. These are the legalists and the lawyers, and they know this story. Now, the way that Jewish version of it ends is like this. Uh, the, the young man comes crawling to his father, and he says, will you forgive me? And the father crosses his arms, and with steely eyes, he looks down on him, and he says, no, you're not welcome here. This is not your home. You have dishonored us. Go back to the pig farm. They were fully expecting that this is how the story would end, but Jesus put a surprise twist to it. You see, the hero is the loving father. So what does the loving father do? It's astonishing. You see, he's waiting. He's watching. He sees the son coming. In the day of Jesus, they didn't jog. But this man literally runs. He pulls up his robe, and he runs for all he's worth because he recognizes his son coming. He not only runs, but this young man who is covered with filth, and he stinks to high heaven, he begins to kiss him, and the verb here kisses him over and over. He smothers him with kisses. And the Scripture says that he is covered in filth, and it's a picture of what Jesus does when he comes into our life. He robes him in righteousness. He puts a new ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, which is a symbol of sonship. And then what do they do? Oh, there, there's one very important notation here. There's one person that's not going to be too happy. 
Do you know who's not going to be happy? Some of you just said the older brother. Really, it's the fatted calf because they're going to have a Texas barbecue. They're going to have brisket and prime rib that night. So they kill the fatted calf, and this young man, he is lost, and now he's found. You see, the ultimate right action is the father's action as he welcomes him home. Some of you are thinking, you know, Pastor Jay, my mistakes are greater than God's mercy. My mistakes are just too much. May I quickly correct you? May I lovingly tell you that your mistakes are not greater than the mercy of God? Right now, do you know what the Lord is doing? He is calling you home. <laughs> there's, a, there's an old story, song, um, called Tie Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree by Tony Orlando. He sang it in 1973. It was the number one song in the land. It made him a zillion dollars and made him famous. The backstory is the guy's gone to prison for three years, and now he is wanting to come home. He has been paroled. You, you know the tagline, even though it's 50 years old. So tie yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? If I don't see a ribbon around the old oak tree, I'll stay on the bus. Forget about us. Put the blame on me. If I don't see a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. But what did he see? He saw a hundred. He saw a hundred and he came home to a hero's welcome. You know, God has tied a yellow ribbon around the oak tree of the cross. And uh, he is basically saying through this service, I love you. I demonstrated my great love for you and that while you were still a sinner, I died on the cross for you. So come home. Come home, my friend. If you're ready to do that, the Lord is calling you. He is inviting you. And right now, I'd like to help you. I'd like to be your guide to bring you home. It's as simple as praying this prayer. It's called a sinner's prayer. It's a prayer of repentance that allows you to turn from your sin and turn to your Savior. If you're ready to pray that prayer, oh, my friend, it's the greatest thing I've ever done is to step out of my death and darkness into God's love and light. And you can do that right now. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you died on that bloody cross. Lord Jesus, right now I turn from my sin. I repent and turn to you as my Savior. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Make me your child. And I promise, Lord Jesus, to follow you all the way. Oh, my friend, if you pray that prayer, the Bible says you've been born again. The angels are rejoicing. We learn in Luke 15, verse 10. But you need to respond. You need to have the right action. Here, here it is. Go to the number right there on the screen and text it. Call it. Say, yes, or I'm coming home. Give us your name. We have people who are awaiting your call. Maybe you are a prodigal and you are coming back home. Maybe you've had severed fellowship with your father. Well, you can never sever the relationship. So let this be the day you come back home. Text that number and reconnect. Can I, I can, can assure you that we are waiting to hear your call.